Welcome to my 258th video on my work with OO gauge. This video will feature a three rail kit built model of a Sentinel steam shunter that I picked up on eBay. I'll start with a bit of a review of the history of Sentinel steam shunting engines, then I'll compare my new three rail model with a couple of other OO gauge models of Sentinel shunters that I have. Then I'll deal with servicing and repairing the new model, and we'll see it running on my 003 rail tabletop. So, Sentinel steam shunters. Quite a few variants were made, and the main ones are shown here. Amongst the big four, the LNER and the LMS were the main users of these engines, with the LNER having quite a few more than the LMS. They were also used in various industrial applications, for example by Fry's, the cocoa and chocolate makers, and by the National Coal Board. The company, Sentinel Wagon Works of Shrewsbury, are probably better known for their steam-driven road vehicles, such as the one shown here. The small railway shunting engines that the company made were closely based on the designs that they developed for road-going vehicles, generally featuring vertically orientated boilers and chain and gear drive to the wheels. Shown here is one of the earliest Sentinel shunting engines. This particular engine was in fact tested by the LMS in 1927, before being purchased and used for many years at the Croydon Gas Works. As a result of the LMS testing of this engine, a couple of similar engines were purchased for use on the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. Here's a diagram of this type of loco, which featured dual engines at the front and a boiler in the rear with the water tank in between. The wheels were chain and gear driven with a single gearing. Here's a picture of that engine in preservation. Seen here is another type of Sentinel shunter acquired by the LMS. This was a one-off acquired by the LMS in 1932, numbered first as 7164 and subsequently as 7184. This engine featured a single engine at the front and a boiler at the rear, with again single-geared chain drive. This diagram is actually of an engine used by Fry's, the cocoa and chocolate maker, but that was much the same as the LMS engine. Here's a picture of the Fry's engine in use. And here's a picture of a loco in preservation. I'm not quite sure which one this is, but it's a loco of this type in preservation. Shown here is what was by far the most common type of sentinel shunting engine. Here you can see a picture of one of these engines in actual LMS use. The LMS bought four of these engines around 1930, and they continued in British Railways use after nationalisation, but all four were withdrawn and scrapped before the end of the 1950s. These engines were designated by Sentinel as either CE for centre engine for the single geared version or CEDG for centre engine double geared for the version with two speed gearing. Seen here is the diagram for the CE version which was designated as Y1 by the LNER. The LNER acquired 15 of these towards the end of the 1920s. And this is the diagram for the CEDG, the double-geared version. Externally, the CE and CEDG versions were essentially identical, featuring a vertical boiler with its chimney at the front and an engine in the centre, driving the wheels via chain and gears. The LNER bought two patches of the double-geared version for a total of about 35 engines. The LMS bought only four. Seen here is perhaps the oddest of all the Sentinel shunters. This was again a one-off acquired by the LMS in the mid-1930s. This engine was oil-fired with a compound four-cylinder arrangement, so presumably two high-pressure and two low-pressure cylinders. It was sadly scrapped in 1963. Here are some examples of models of Sentinel shunters in OO gauge and O gauge. So far as I can gather, all of the generally available models have been based on the most common type, the CE slash CEDG version as used by the LNER and LMS. 
So now on from general history to my own models. This was the first model of a Sentinel shunter that I acquired, and I believe it is the only OO gauge model of these engines ever to be available ready to run. This model was produced by Daypol as an exclusive for Model Rail magazine. My example of this model currently lives on my upstairs Hornby 2 rail layout in a little diorama featuring a container being loaded onto a Conflat wagon by a travelling yard crane built from the Airfix slash Daypol kit. Seen here is the second OO gauge model of a Sentinel shunter that I acquired, at this time a kit-built example from a kit of unknown manufacturer. Both this model and the model rail Daypol version are clearly based on the CECDG Sentinel engines. This two-rail kit-built version is mounted on a pre-made Japanese 040 chassis. Here you may see the markings on that chassis, Tenshodo. It's not a chassis I'm terribly familiar with. And this is my latest acquisition, a three-rail kit-built model, presumably intended to represent a Sentinel shunter of the center engine type. Here's the bottom of that model showing the pickup arrangements and the gears. Here you can see my previous kit-built version together with the new one. Clearly something is a bit off, as the three-rail model has very different, much longer proportions. I don't think the coal load is really quite right either, since there should be some sort of a vent for the water tank in the middle. The new model bears British Railways number 68138, which would make it one of the centre-engine double-geared Sentinels acquired by the LNER. Here's a picture of an engine from that same LNER batch in BR service. As you may see, both the cab and the water tank are shorter in proportion, and whilst coal is spread over the top of the tank, the tank vent is very clearly visible. Well, actually, it's maybe not so much a vent as a filler. Here you can see my new three-rail version at the top and my previous kit-built version at the bottom. It's obvious how much longer the three-rail version is. The three-rail version also has a round chimney with no cap, as opposed to the other model, which has an oval chimney with a cap. I think one has to conclude that the three-rail version, whilst approximating a centre-engine Sentinel shunter, is not very accurate. I've searched quite extensively, and I can't find any evidence of a longer version such as this actually being made. And the numbering of this model would certainly make it one of the standard LNERCEDG slash Y3 engines. My new model seemed temperamental about running. When I first tried it, I got nothing. But when I tried it again, it worked for a bit and then stopped. So clearly it wasn't entirely dead, but something wasn't right. I examined the bottom of the model as I wanted to remove the body from the chassis, but I couldn't see anything obvious in the way of holding body and chassis together. OK, first running attempts with this little uh, kit-built three-rail Sentinel, sort of. When I first tried to run this, it seemed very unwilling to run. But then I just poked the coal load there, and it took off. Sorry, I didn't get it on video. This was just sort of preliminary experimentation. And since that, I have studiously avoided poking the coal load again. And it seems to run fairly okay. That's 65% on the gauge master. So clearly there's some sort of a short circuit or loose connection or something or other underneath that coal load which seems to be built on a piece of brass as far as I can see it looks like they feed a piece of curved brass in and then stuck the coal to the top of that the problem is I can't see how to get this apart it's a kit built thing so of course there's no uh, manual or service sheet or anything and I can't figure out how the heck to get it apart but anyway that's about 65 percent now we'll take it the other way now it's actually going backwards because I've got the controller set to backwards, but I think really that's forwards for this because I meant the coal, I don't know, really. I mean, it's a shunter, so it, should, it could go either way. But I would say on the whole, you'd think of the coal bunker as at the back and the flat side being the front. So 
I would call this going forwards, but it's actually according to the way the motor's set up and whatever, it's going backwards. This is slowing down now. But it is going at 70, 70% 70 on the gauge master. I'm going to have to figure out how to take it apart, really, well, because I want to, apart from the else, I want to, uh, uh, what else, I probably want to change the markings, and I want to figure out what's going on with the, its tendency to short circuit or lose its connection or whatever it is. My problem is I can't see any way of taking this apart, I mean, it, its body seems loose, it doesn't seem fastened on or anything, but it won't actually come off. It'll only lift up a little bit and then it sticks. Now, I don't know if it's just sticking on that coal load or what it's sticking on. So it's, I can't quite figure out how to take it apart. The coal load seemed sort of loose, so I pried it up and I was able to remove it. The coal was basically just stuck onto the top of what appeared to be a piece of a tin can, held in place by the folded edges of the can piece tucking into the sides of the body. With the coal load removed, I was able to wiggle the body off from the chassis. It appeared that no effort had been made to actually fix it in place. The body was apparently made of brass. The simplex couplings were mounted to the body by rivets rather than being mounted to the chassis. The chassis had a large, rather crudely shaped piece of lead round the top on the water tank end. This was held in place simply by pinching against the sides of the centre of the chassis. The chassis was labelled on the front end with Romford Models Limited. I'm unclear exactly how much of this model actually came from Romford. I removed a piece of lead. This left a solid chassis with a centre-mounted motor driving both sets of wheels through dual worm gearing. The brushes were pivoted through grooves on the back of the chassis held in place by springs, somewhat similarly to the arrangement with X03 and X04 motors. As with those motors, one brush was in direct contact with the spring and so in electrical contact with the main body of the chassis, whilst the other arm of the spring was fitted with an insulating tube, so that brush could be electrically fed separately. I tried the model with my bench power supply. It worked mostly, but would sometimes stop working for no immediately obvious reason. I lubricated the model with oil on the bearings and oil and grease on the gears. I had cleaned the wheels with a bronze brush and a rotary tool before my initial running attempts, because I don't like to put dirt onto my tracks any more than I have to. At this point, I managed to discover why the model wasn't operating reliably. Power from the centre rail pickup was supposed to be passed to the insulated brush via the yellow wire seen here but the end of that yellow wire wasn't actually attached in any way. It had a small piece of something soldered to its end, and that was just resting against the brush, so sometimes making contact, sometimes not, and probably sometimes touching the side of the chassis and causing a short circuit. Here you can see that wire pulled out to the side of the chassis. Not an awful lot to work with there. I thought that perhaps I could solder the end piece of the wire directly to the brush, I brushed both with DCC Concepts Flux, but I couldn't get solder to take on the arm of the brush. I figured that I was going to have to extend the wire so as to be able to get its end into reliable contact with the brush. Of course, I could have just put on a new piece of wire, but then I'd have had to sort of figure out how it was attached to the centre rail pickup, and I thought it was simpler to use the wire that was there since it was already properly attached to the pickup. I soldered a short piece of wire to the end. Then I covered the join between the original wire and my extension with shrink wrap so there'd be no short circuiting. I stripped the end of my extension wire, tinned it, and tried to fit it between the top of the brush and the insulating sleeve. That didn't really work. Contact was still intermittent at best. I used a multimeter to check continuity. It appeared that continuity between the centre rail pickup and the stripped end of my extension wire was fine, so the problem was just that I wasn't making proper contact between the wire and the brush. I got out some phosphor bronze strip and cut a small piece to make a contact for the end of the wire. 
As you can see, I cut a piece of thin bronze strip about four millimeters in length and bent it in the middle. I soldered that contact piece to the end of my extension wire. And then I fitted that contact piece in place between the insulating sleeve on the spring and the end of the brush. The motor still didn't run reliably. Checking continuity again, I found that I was now getting continuity from the centre rail pickup to its brush fine, but that continuity between the chassis and the other brush was iffy. I took out the uninsulated side of the spring and cleaned the end of the spring and cleaned the inside of the top of the brush where it was supposed to make contact with the spring. After that cleaning, the motor finally worked reliably. Having, I believed, fixed the problems with the chassis, I turned my attention to remarking the body as I wanted to mark this as an LMS engine. I tried some microset on the markings, but it had no effect. The markings didn't appear to be regular water slide decals. Rather than making further efforts to remove the markings, I simply painted over them with some flat black acrylic paint. My previous two-rail kit-built Sentinel model was marked in gold, but I thought that straw markings might be more appropriate, so I got out the corresponding set of HMRS press-fix transfers. I put LMS letters onto the sides of the tank end of the body. I had to put the letters on one at a time, as the spacing on the decal sheet was too wide for this model. Here you can see those letters after the backing tissue was wetted and removed. I applied numbers to the side of the cab end of the body. The four center engine double geared locos acquired by the LMS were numbered 7160 to 7163 and later changed to 7180 to 7183. I chose to number this model as 7162, cutting out and spacing the digits as best as I could. I did the same thing on the other side of the body. And here are those markings with the backing removed. I reassembled the model, refitting the lead weight round the end of the chassis and putting the body back on. I found it difficult to get the metal piece with the coal load fitted properly. I did my best, but the result was rather awkward, although probably about how it was originally. Finally, I got the model back onto my three-rail tabletop for some more running. Well, let's see. I've uh, tried to fix the bad connection from the wire from the third rail pickup, and I've changed the markings on this. Let's see how it works now. I mean, it worked before when you uh, so when I managed to get that wire to connect. And I'm, quite honestly, I'm surprised that wire connected at all before because it was just flopping around and resting next to the to the, the brush. It wasn't actually in any positive way connected to the brush at all. But it did work. Let me see if I can get a couple of wagons out and see if this can actually tow a couple of wagons. Well, I've hooked a couple of wagons up behind this thing. Actually, I've tried a couple of different wagons, and it seems like virtually whatever wagons I hook up behind it, it has trouble pulling them. I don't know where, you see what I mean? It's just getting stuck. Whether well, it's because it has, you know, I think that second wagon's derailed now. I don't know. Oh, blizzard. Is that wagon derailed? I don't know, I can't tell. Oh. It, uh, yeah, it's certainly not very good at pulling things for some reason. Oh no, see now, now that, well, yes, that wagon has derailed. Oh. Well, honestly, it seems next to impossible to persuade this thing to pull anything. I don't know, it just, the famous last words, now it's not going at all again. I think part of the problem is that the couplings are on the body of it, and that doesn't make for good coupling with the wagons. So it, it struggles. See, it's come off again. 
it really doesn't work very well at all in terms of oh, blimey I don't know yeah no see the wagons behind the wagons keep derailing and I think that's basically because it has lousy couplings it has its couplings just are not effective oh I don't know it's pretty hopeless and it can't push wagons really either because if you try and make it push them oh if it's not one thing it's another that also doesn't work well because oh I don't crying out loud oh for goodness sake no see it, it just really doesn't want to work it sort of works on its own but not very well pulling or pushing anything I'm not touching the controller either why it's sort of wandering up and down like this I don't know probably because the wheels are not contacting the the uh, okay I give it and that's about the best I can do honestly it's not great but still uh, it's sort of interesting <laughs>